Uh, hi, my name is Dave Masick. Uh, I'm the environmental specialist for the Aroostook Band of Micmac. I've worked for the tribe for 24 years. Um, I currently do air quality work for the tribe and I manage the Micmac farm and the Micmac fish hatchery. Okay, so this, this is our filter system here for the fish hatchery. The particulates are filtered out in this uh, pit, this drum filter. The chemicals are taken out in the biofilter there. Um, over here we We're hatching eggs right now. We've got 45,000 uh, eggs and mostly babies now. They're just about completely hatched. They're now called sack fry. They've got a little belly full of food that they'll consume over a period of about two and a half weeks before they become free swimming and start looking for food. We raise the fish out over here. This is last year's babies. We'll be pond stocking these. Um, would you like me to get a net and scoop some? These guys will be all put out into ponds in uh, April and May. And uh, this tank here is the tank where all our food fish live. And these will be on the table sometime pretty soon. Right, we, it's, we, it's a recirculating aquaculture system and we, we reuse 90% of the water. The uh, water that does exit the building is treated in a septic system um, and the waste is captured there and the water is returned back into the ground through that septic system. So yeah, we start with well water, drinking quality well water and we, we treat it and it goes back to the ground. We don't have any discharges and uh, and no consumption as, uh, of water or diverting water in any, any way. But that waste does uh, accumulate in a septic system and we on an annual basis, usually in June, we'll pump it out and spread it on a fallow vegetable field. We'll put a cover crop on it and we'll grow that for a season. And our cover crops, we're, we're real pollinator friendly here. We like to use a three to five species mix that uh, bees can benefit from. and. Uh, then those get tilled back into the ground and uh, the field is ready to use for vegetables the following year. So we, we rotate you know, that around and um, it, it's a real good fertilizer. My name is Fred Corey and I'm currently the computer support specialist for the Aroostook Band of Micmacs. I started working with the tribe back in 1996 and uh, when I first started working with the tribe. The tribe was newly federally recognized. It had become federally recognized in 1991. And uh, we did not have a land base, but we had a need for an environmental program primarily associated with um, environmental health issues and tribal housing. So in the very beginning, our environmental program was co-located with our health department in the same facility. And um, through that experience, every day I really kind of got to see what, what happens to people when they lose access to the resources that keep them healthy. Um, in the case of the Aroostook Band of Micmacs, there's very high incidences of um, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and other similar diseases. And in talking with the health staff, they told me that that was the result of diet and exercise issues. And for the Aroostook Band of Micmacs, uh, two of their traditional foods were moose and salmon, were foods that they relied upon, which are very, very healthy foods and really good for you. But because the tribe had lost um, it, its land and no longer had a land base, uh, there was no ability to um, hunt for moose and use moose as a form of subsistence. And of course, we've lost all of our salmon because the rivers were dammed up. Um, we do have other natural resources here, um, but they 
uh, are not in the greatest condition and that's primarily due to uh, pollution and over harvesting and anthropogenic effects and a whole host of other problems. So in those early days we set some goals to restore our resources so they could be used and would support a, a healthy way of life. Um, since the salmon are gone we still have brook trout which is a, a species that was of historical importance to the Aroostook Band of Micmacs. Um, however, Maine has a statewide fish consumption advisory due to the presence of mercury in fish tissue. And if you're a, a woman of childbearing age or a child, you're only supposed to eat one fish meal a month. For everybody else, it's one fish meal a week. So obviously that's not enough uh, protein to support you, but we started working with the Environmental Protection Agency and other organizations to see what we could do um, with regard to the mercury problem. Um, as time went on, we realized that it's a very pervasive problem. Mercury is a global pollutant and no matter what we do here in Maine, we're the tailpipe of the nation. We're, we're downwind of all the big industrial centers in the United States. We're also downwind of China and every other place on the planet. So th the goal of restoring brook trout um, to be able to to be consumed w without fear for what it's going to do to your health is, is um, that's going to be a longer term challenge. Um, about the same time we also started to become really concerned with climate change and what's happening with our local natural resources and the, the brook trout is Maine's um, most ubiquitous fish and actually this is the, the last stronghold of the brook trout um, in the United States at, at historical ranges follow the Appalachian mountain chain right down on into Georgia and then north into Canada but due to climate change and um, development and pollution and a whole bunch of other factors really the last stronghold in the U.S. is here in, in Maine. So we also had an interest in protecting that diminishing resource for future generations of, of Mi'kmaq people. Also about that same time when we were thinking about this, the tribe acquired some property at the former Loring Air Force Base in Limestone, Maine. And that site also has brook trout, but there's a no fish consumption advisory there due to the presence of PCBs, which is a toxic chemical. So even though there's fish there, they cannot be consumed. Um, our environmental specialist, he had the idea that since uh, the fish that the former Loring Air Force Base could no longer be consumed, then maybe what we needed to do was um, have the Air Force build the tribe a fish hatchery to replace those fish that are no longer able to be consumed. We did approach the Air Force about that and they uh, told us that that was not something that they could do or had the authority to do, but that, that kind of planted the seed for that idea that, well, maybe if we built a fish hatchery, um, we could take some pressure off the wild fish stocks by encouraging people to go out and fish and have fun fishing and take your family fishing. It's a great um, cultural activity. It, it's good for exercise. Um, but leave the wild fish in the wild and if you want to consume fish you could buy fish from our fish hatchery which are um, which don't have the problems with the PCBs or mercury or other contaminant. So we, we thought about that idea and uh, then we approached the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and they thought that that was a good idea as well. So they actually provided us some funding to, to build our fish hatchery and that's um, kind of all, how it all started. And so the fish hatchery is working to uh, protect the wild fish by uh, taking some pressure off those wild fish. Like I say, we encourage people to go and fish and have fun fishing but leave the wild fish in the wild and when they want to consume fish to come to our fish hatchery to purchase those because they're safe to consume. Um, one footnote that I want to um, add which is really important from a tribal perspective is that although it's great that we have this fish hatchery here and we're able to provide a clean source of protein to the, the tribal community um, it does not replace uh, what's happened to the, the wild fish. Um, we have some community members that are so concerned about the contaminants in the fish that they won't even allow their children to go fishing. And as far as we know, there are no risks associated with the act of fishing. It's when you consume the fish is, is when you incur the risk. 
but they are so concerned about the contaminants they don't take their children fishing and in the case of the fish that have been lost like the salmon all those traditional songs and dances and ceremonies and all the cultural activities that go along with the salmon harvest have been lost and um, even though we've got this clean source of fish for the tribal community to consume we're losing those fishing harvesting um, cultural practices which are the songs and ceremonies and dances and all the other cultural activities and, and that can't be replaced by saying come to the hatchery and hear some fish and eat this so we're, so so there's still an obligation on behalf of the u.s federal government to restore tribal resources they have a trust responsibility a solemn obligation to protect tribal resources and right now they're not being protected because the fish are not safe to consume so but it's good that we're able to do this but it's bittersweet and there's still lots of work to do um, and, and right now we're looking to expand the uh, fish hatchery because fortunately there's been more demand for our fish than there is supply. Uh, we've been selling fish for stocking to the main public and um, we sell all the fish that we have for stocking and that exceeds what we can produce. And also in terms of fresh consumption, we sell a lot of fish here locally to local uh, non-tribal members and then we also sell some of our fish in a couple of fish markets down in Portland and Rockland and we can't satisfy those demands as well. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, brook trout is Maine's most ubiquitous fish and there's a lot of interest in it and the fish that we're producing um, are raised in a, a healthy manner without chemicals or antibiotics so a lot of people that are concerned about their health and want a good clean source of protein have an interest but um, we're in, I guess, the fortunate situation that demand um, exceeds supply. So we're right now working and planning towards expanding our facility. Um, so that will enable us to have more fish for pond stocking and more fish for fresh consumption, but also create some local jobs for tribal community members and other non-tribal community members that reside in the local area. Well, we, the, the, the expansion that we're planning on having is going to allow us to be able to comfortably raise more pond stocking fish, but it'll also allow me to have food fish year round. We currently can't have that. If I were only raising food fish, I could have it year round, but because we're doing pond stocking as well now, I have to have um, the extra space to be able to do it. So that, that's going to you know, allow us to do that. It'll allow us to increase the pond stocking as well. We have more demand than we can fill at the current time, so it'll, it'll be nice to be able to develop that market a little more and be able to have fish for everybody and not turn customers away. Well, with brook trout, we're real concerned that um, there's an imaginary line somewhere down through Maine that keeps moving northward, and that line is the line um, below which it, it's really difficult for brook trout to survive in man-made ponds or the ponds that people have built for fish stocking and the reason is with because of climate change and our warming climate we do a uh, trade show down in the Augusta area in the spring and, and we meet with a lot of sportsmen that have their own ponds and uh, folks from southern Maine tell us they would love to stock their ponds with brook trout and they've even tried but that the fish don't survive because the waters are too warm the bigger natural bodies of water, uh, spring-fed streams and ponds and lakes, I, I think the fish um, can survive in those waters, and they still do all the way down into Georgia. But those areas where the habitat's suitable, where the waters aren't too warm, are continually decreasing. Just as our climate warms, there's less suitable habitat for brook trout. So um, for pond stocking, the, the those opportunities uh, for brook trout in particular are limited because of the, the change in climate. Um, and that's you know another reason why it's real important that here in northern Maine where we still do have wild populations and we have cold waters, uh, we do everything we can to protect that habitat and those populations just because in other places, uh, southern Maine on down the, the uh, Appalachian Mountains, th those areas, the habitat is continually decreasing.
Uh, the, there's definitely a great um, cultural appreciation for the brook trout. And I can give you an example of that. When we first started uh, producing fish, we were really concerned about how it would be received by the community because we have a, um, a population segment um, of, of the population that had lost access to fish. And, and those folks, a lot of them, I guess they're like in their uh, 30s, I guess, in that age range, where I had mentioned that the tribe had lost um, its land base and didn't have access to fishing or fish. So there's a, there was a whole generation of tribal members that, um, because they had lost access to fish, had never consumed it and don't have an interest in consuming it. So they think that it's a foreign substance and they don't really want to consume it. So that scared us quite a bit. And um, our tribal health department, they gave out food vouchers to each uh, tribal family so that they could come to the farm and, and they had their choice of fish or vegetables, whatever they wanted to buy. So we were real curious to see what was going to happen when some of these uh, folks that are in that 30-something age range came in, what, what they would select um, for their foods. And uh, to our surprise, they were actually selecting the fish and they weren't consuming it themselves because they've never developed that appreciation for it but they have children and they wanted to give that fish to their children and get their children consuming the fish because it is such an important cultural tradition. So that was great to see, even though we've lost, there's one population segment that's kind of lost that appreciation. It's being re-ingrained into the community. Um, another example is it, like most tribes and, and tribal culture, all tribal activities involve a meal or food. That's uh, one of those really fun parts of tribal culture is that you don't have a meeting or a gathering or anything without food. Um, and for years and years before the tribe had access to its own food, um, we had Domino's pizza on speed dial. So whenever you're gonna have a meeting or a gathering, a lot of times it was pizza because it, it was relatively inexpensive, it was quick, it was easy, and everybody likes pizza. So. Um, because we have a lot of interest in improving the health in the tribal community and now we have the fish uh, that's raised by the tribe and it's a real wholesome and healthy food, uh, we thought we would start to change that paradigm by instead of serving pizza at the tribal gatherings and events, we, we would serve fish. And uh, early on we were concerned about that as well. We were thinking this is maybe not going to go over so well because everybody's wanting, expecting and, you know, thinking about pizza and then instead they're served fish. Well, you know, actually those fears uh, really, you know, there was no basis for those fears. It, it, we purchased some smokers and we smoked the fish and we provided that to the community and everybody just really enjoyed it a, a great deal. And we, we could tell there was a great sense of pride also in that this is a product that's culturally relevant. It's produced by the tribe, for the tribe. and people uh, embraced it and, and that was just great to see and that, that's continued on now and um, you know that I guess that goes to tell you just how deep that cultural connection is because they're you know they just totally embraced it right out of the gate even though they hadn't had access to it for a long time because of the issue with the, the loss of the land base and the contamination issues um, but when it was brought back they totally embraced it. So that, that, I guess, gives me hope with, with some of our other natural resources and some of the other cultural practices that um, either had been lost or diminished because of changes that were happening. If we can find a way to bring those back, it, it's just a natural thing that the tribe has been doing for thousands of years. So they will embrace that, um, w which is just really neat because, uh, I mean, and that's what makes the Mi'kmaq population so unique. Micmac Boys and Girls Club, they've really been a leader in that area where they bring the kids out to the farm and show them the whole process of how the fish are being raised and then uh, the, the fish are harvested and cleaned and then they take them back to their office in Presque Isle and they actually involve the youth in preparing the fish and consuming the fish and the youth have really embraced that so they're learning how to prepare the fish in a healthy manner and uh, getting to taste it and consume it and I, I think that's really important. They, they've also done that with other 
food resources, like uh, they served a, a squash pasta. So it looks just like spaghetti, um, except that it's made out of squash. And it, for people that eat it, they may not even know that they're eating vegetables um, because it really tastes similar to traditional pasta, but it, it's uh, just very, very healthy for you. So I, I think that's really important that that's where we need to start is with the, the youth and get them um, educated on how to prepare the, these foods and, and just get used to eating these foods. And really, then you start them on a lifelong path to, to health and well-being. And that's really what we want to do is start young and start early. And traditionally, that's how it would have worked in the tribal community. But because the loss of access to those resources, we've kind of got to rebuild that. But if we start with those youth, then we will put them on that path to lifelong health and wellness.